In the beginning, the phrase brings to mind the first words of the Bible and the opening of what many of us hold as the story of the creation of the world. This piece explores other stories of creation from other times and places. The piece is extremely programmatic in that each movement tells a particular story through sound. As some of these stories are not pleasant, some of the sounds you will hear are not pleasant. And you will see some very unconventional treatment of the orchestra, not to mention an electric bassoon. You will see and hear things you may have never experienced before. As I researched, researched various creation stories from around the world, many had similarities. The prologue introduces some of these similarities, such as a vast emptiness, water, earth arising from the water, winds and storms and violent upheavals. The prologue begins with the emptiness, then water and waves begin in the strings and grow. Wind is heard in the brass, and the earth arises out of the waves heard in the electric bassoon. For the beginning of the piece, an octatonic scale is used, which alternates whole and half steps, or whole tones and semitones. After the earth arises from the, water, from the waves, the oldest melody that we have record of is played. It is called the Hurrian Hymn and was written sometime around 1400 BC and is used to symbolize the creation of plants, animals, and humans. The bassoon has a little cadenza at the end, creating not only the melody, but accompanying himself as well. Each of the following movements will represent a creation myth of one of the continents, with the exception of Antarctica, for obvious reasons. I will introduce each movement with the story being shared in sound, as well as things to listen for in the music. First, the prologue.
Africa. Perhaps no other continent has more creation stories than Africa. This story is somewhat representative of a number of the stories. In the beginning, people did not live on the surface of the earth, but people and animals lived together under the earth with Kong, the great master and lord of all life. Animals and people lived together peacefully and understood each other. No one ever wanted for anything, and it was always light, even though there was no sun. During this time of bliss, Kong began to plan the wonders he would put in the world above. He created a wondrous tree with branches stretching over the entire country, and at the base of the tree, he dug a hole that reached to where the people and animals were. After he had furnished the world as he pleased, he led the first man out of the hole. Soon the first woman followed. It wasn't long before all the people were gathered at the foot of the tree, awed by the world they had just entered. Next, Kong began helping animals climb out of the hole. Some, in their excitement, climbed through the root of the tree and out of the branches. Kong told the people and animals to live together peacefully and warned the men and women not to build any fires or a great evil would befall them. Kong left and watched secretly. As evening approached and the sun began to sink below the horizon, people and animals watched this phenomenon. When it was dark, the people became afraid. They did not have eyes that could see in the dark like the animals. It grew cold. It was suggested they build a fire, and so they did, which warmed them and gave them light. However, this frightened the animals, and in chaos, they fled to caves and mountains. They could no longer communicate with humans, and fear replaced friendship. What to listen for in this piece? The opening imitates tribal singing with swooping chords. Everything is harmonious. The bassoon carries a folk melody from Afri Africa. Then you will hear the tree grow with rising lines in the winds and strings. Everyone marvels at the new world. Then darkness comes and humans build the fire. You will hear animals in chaos and the folk song becomes distorted in the bassoon. The piece ends with the animals scattering in fright into caves and mountains until they disappear.
Australia. There was a time when everything was still. All the spirits of the earth were asleep, or almost all. The great father of all spirits was the only one awake. Gently he, wo he awoke the sun mother. As she opened her eyes, a warm ray of light spread out towards the sleeping earth. The father of all spirits said to the sun mother, Mother, I have work for you to do. Go down to the earth and awake the sleeping spirits. Give them forms. The sun mother glided down to earth, which was bare at the time, and began to walk in all directions, and everywhere she walked, plants grew. After returning to the field where she had begun her work, the mother rested, well pleased with herself. The father of all spirits came and saw her work, but instructed her to go into the caves and wake the spirits. This time she ventured into the dark caves of the mountainsides. The bright light that radiated from her awoke the spirits, and after she left, insects of all kinds flew out of the caves. The sun mother sat down and watched the glorious sight of her insects mingling with her flowers. However, once again, the father urged her on. The mother ventured into a very deep cave, spreading her light around. Her, her heat melted the ice and the rivers, and streams of the world were created. Then she created fish and small snakes, lizards and frogs. Next, she awoke the spirits of the birds and animals, and they burst into the sunshine in a glorious array of colors. Seeing this, the father of all spirits was pleased with the sun mother's work. She called all her creatures to her and instructed them to enjoy the wealth of the earth and to live peacefully with one another. Then she rose into the sky and became the sun. What to listen for? The father god, represented by the bassoon, imitates a didgeridoo, wakening the sun mother. Here in the you can hear that in the, the flute and clarinet, and tells her to go to earth, which is the, the sun god is, or the father god is represented by the bassoon and the didgeridoo. She glides down to earth, heard in the woodwinds, and she takes steps, chords in the woodwinds, and plants and trees and flowers grow, strings and upward scales and trills. An aboriginal welcoming song is introduced in the bassoon. The father god, the bassoon again, returns. The sun mother floats down into the caves, the woodwinds again, and awakens the insects. Here the brass play with just their mouthpieces. I hope you can hear them because I told them to play really loud. Um, and the low strings with welcoming song. Father God returns, the bassoon again, and sends Sun Mother deep into caves. She goes down, strings and low brass, you'll hear them descend in a chromatic scale, and her heart, her warmth melts ice into rivers and streams and awakens birds, fishes, frogs, animals, and humans, and you'll hear that in the woods, winds, and brass. She welcomes them all with her welcome song and floats up into the sky and becomes the sun. Thank <laughs> you. 
Europe. Thanks to Marvel, Marvel movies, we are all aware of the god Odin, father of Thor. He appears as a benevolent and loving father, stern when necessary, and very wise. The Norse creation myth is not quite so nice. In the beginning, there was a great void with fire on one side and ice on the other. As these two sides come together, there is popping and sizzling, creating great droplets of water. From these droplets is born the giant Ymir, the first of the godlike yet destructive giants. Ymir was a hermaphrodite and able to reproduce asexually. As he sleeps, other gods are born from the hair of his legs and the sweat of his armpits. Attractive. The frost continues to melt and produces a giant cow that nourishes Ymir with her milk. Through marriages of gods and half-gods, Odin is born with his brothers Vili and Ve, grandsons of Ymir. As any good grandchild would do, they kill Ymir and use his body to create parts of the world, oceans from his blood, soil from his skin and muscles, vegetation from his hair, clouds from his brains, and sky from his skull. Then eventually, the first man and woman are formed. What to listen for? The peace begins with the vast space. As fire and ice come together, pops and sizzles happen, and the giant Ymir is born with rising glissandi and a terrible cord with stomping. The bassoon makes a cow sound, because there's a cow in the story. Then the other gods are born as Ymir sleeps. 
After Ymir sleeps, he is suddenly killed by Odin and his brothers. There's a big, loud, ugly chord at that point. And falls to the ground with descending and ascending scales. The percussion signals his demise as he crashes to the ground. Various instruments enter, representing Ymir's body growing into, the part, into parts of the world. At the end, a Norse folk song represents the creation of man and woman. North America. Before the days of animals and people, there was a great ocean and the only living thing was a great bird, a raven. The raven, after a long time, flew down and dipped his wing into the water and the earth arose. The raven finds himself alone and befriends a sparrow who appears out of nowhere and may be older than raven. They come to a great abyss and look over the edge. Sparrow flies down to explore and reports the earth is beginning to form. Raven flies down and sets about creating animals, trees, humans, and everything we know on earth. Raven creates a pod of a beech pea which, in which man grows. After four days, the pod pops open and the man falls out onto soft, mushy ground, fully grown. When he looked back, he saw, still hanging to the vine, the pod of the beech pea with a hole in the lower end out of which he had dropped. When he looked about him again, he saw that he was getting farther from his starting place. The ground seemed to move up and down under his feet, and it was very soft. Raven comes and is astonished at this new creature. He moves him to more solid ground and feeds him. Then Raven creates other animals out of clay. He beats his wings four times, and mountain sheep come to life. The man was so much pleased that Raven said, If these animals are plentiful, perhaps people will try to kill them. 
The man said, yes. So Raven sends them into the high mountains and cliffs. Then he makes reindeer and caribou, waves his wings four times, and they come to life and bound away. Then Raven creates a woman to be a companion because the man is lonely. Raven waves his wings four times, and she comes to life. Raven continues to create life, fish, the shrew mouse, muskrat, insects, etc. Raven was afraid men would kill and eat his animals, so he created a bear to make the man cautious. What to listen for? The piece begins with crow cause in the bassoon. He hops around and Sparrow comes. Sparrow is represented by the piccolo playing the oldest complete song known, the Sekalos epitaph. They come to the edge of the scary abyss and look over the edge. Then they fly down with random glissandi in the orchestra. The temple block represents the pod popping open and the man emerging. The low strings then imitate a style of singing called throat singing, unique to the Inuit and other Alaskan native tribes, representing the beginning of man. The bassoon enters with a Native American folk tune representing raven creating things. The woodwinds imitate raven beating his wings four times to bring things to life. The bassoon then represents the sheep bounding away into high places. With each beating of the wings four times, more things come to life, represented by the folk hymn. South America. Before the world had a true form, there were two gods. These gods were Tepeu, the maker, and Gukumats, the feathered spirit. While the world around them was dark, the two gods glittered with brilliant blue and green feathers. They came together to create the world. Whatever they thought came into being. When they thought earth, land formed in the darkness. They thought of mountains and valleys, pine trees in sky, all of these things appeared in the instant they thought them, and thus the earth was formed. Tepeo and Gukumats decided that they needed, to be, needed beings there to look after their vast creation and to praise their names as the creators. 
So they created deer and birds and panthers and serpents, all the creatures that roam the earth today. Now praise us. Say our names, commanded the creators. But the animals could only roar and howl, bleat, bark, twitter, or moan. They tried as hard as they could to speak, but they could not. They chirped and mewed at the top of their lungs until the noise was so deafening that Tepeu and Gukumats ordered them to stop. Disappointed, the makers agreed that they would have to create better beings, ones who would be able to worship them properly. The first race of men were made from wet clay. The creators gave them life, and the first men tried to speak. But instead, they crumbled apart soon after they were made. The maker and the feathered spirit were determined to create a hardier race of men. The second race of men were carved from wood. These were much stronger and were able to walk and talk and multiply, but these men had no minds and their hearts were empty. They had no memories of their creation, and when they spoke their words, when they spoke, their words were just as empty and meaningless. They could not praise their gods. Tepeu and Gukumats sent a great flood down to destroy them. They commanded the animals to attack the survivors and tear them to pieces. The few who managed to escape fled to the woods and became monkeys. The creators left them there as an example to the next race of men. The maker and the feathered spirit thought for a long time about how they should make the race of men they wanted. There seemed to be no perfect material to build them. Finally, some animals brought the gods a stack of white corn, which grew on the far side of the earth. Tepeu and Gukumats ground this into a paste, and from this formed four individual men. The new beings seemed perfect. They were sturdy enough to last, and their minds were rich in thoughts and feelings. Their first act after their creation was to immediately worship Tepeu and Gukumats and thank them for their lives. What to listen for. The two gods are represented with high strings and low strings. Tepeu is associated with winds and tornadoes, where Gukumats is a brilliant feathered spirit. They create the trees and flowers and ask them to praise them represented by the bassoon playing a motive from a South American wedding song. There is nothing but the wind in response. Then they create animals, and the bassoon again asks them to praise the gods. The animals try, but can only produce chaotic animal sounds. Then they create the first men from mud. Again they ask to be praised, but the men can only form basic sounds that do not praise the gods. The gods react. The strings say, oh no. You can listen for that by sending floods to wipe them out, then the animals to tear them to pieces. Finally, they make men from maize. The bassoon asks them to praise the gods. They do so, and the gods are pleased. From there on, the full folk melody is played, and everyone is happy.
and finally Asia. Long, long ago, not in a land before time, but a time before land, there was nothing in the universe except an enormous egg-shaped entity. Inside the egg, the opposite forces of yin and yang were all scrambled. It was a complete mess. But over time, the interactions between various substances and energies eventually conceived a being, a shaggy, horned giant named Pongu. For 18,000 years, Pongu slept and grew. One day, he suddenly awoke. He opened his eyes, but saw only pitch blackness. He strained his ears, but heard only unnerving silence. Pongu found his dreary surroundings highly disturbing. Flustered, Pongu conjured a magical axe and landed, and landed upon the egg a mighty chop. The egg split in two with a thunderous crack. Slowly, yin and yang began to separate. Everything dark and heavy sank down to form the earth, and the rest, light and clear, drifted up to form the heavens. But Pongu was anxious that the halves would, choo- would close up again, and so he stood between the two halves to, and kept them apart. With each passing day, the sky rose ten feet further above him, the earth thickened ten feet below him, and Pongu himself grew ten feet just to keep up with the growing expanse and hold on. It was a lonely and strenuous job. This toil, the conscientious conscientious giant, endured for another 6,570,000 days, or another 18,000 years if you couldn't do the math, until he was certain that the realms were finally stabilized. Then with a great crash, Pongu lay down and died. As the weary Pongu collapsed, a miraculous transformation took place. First, his final breath turned into winds and clouds, his voice into rumbling thunder, his left eye blazed into the sun and right eye gleamed into the moon, his hair and beard became stars of the Milky Way, his limbs and hands and feet transformed into great mountains, and the blood running through his veins into flowing rivers, his flesh converted into fertile farmlands, his bone turned to precious gems and minerals, his teeth and nails became lustrous metals, the hair on his skin burgeoned into lush lush vegetation, and the sweat from his extended labors fell as rainwater for the mortal world. Some say that Pongu's spirit never ceased, but turned into humans, which accounts for the ancient Chinese belief that humans are the soul of all matter. What to listen for? The beginning represents the enormous egg and the chaos of yin and yang inside the egg. The egg egg cracks and Pongu begins pushing yin and yang apart as the Pongu folk melody is played in the bassoon. You hear the strings start to separate. As Pongu begins to die, the bassoon descends chromatically. Other instruments join the downward motion and he dies with a whoosh. Then various instruments enter, representing the metamorphosis of Pongu into the earth we know today. The bassoon gets one more quasi-cadenza, and the orchestra finishes with grandiose chords.